If part of being an oppressed person means that you are in reference to the dominant ideologies of those in power, in this case men's sexual fantasies, desires, wishes, wants, pleasures, representations, interests, needs, how do oppressed people construct themselves outside of the oppressor? Brianne Foz, Performing Sex, The Making and Unmaking of Women's Erotic Lives. Hello, welcome back to my channel, or welcome. This video is the last part of the sex politics series on my channel. And speaking of, apologies for the repeated delays of getting this video out. I'm clearly not in my own space right now. I'm actually visiting family outside of the country. So it's just been a little tricky to really sit down and focus on the creation of this video. But here I am. So when I was brainstorming how to end the series, I had tossed a couple of ideas around, but none of them really stuck. So until I went back to my analysis of the idol, which is the second part to the series, and I saw a lot of comments expressing the same frustration with the fact that Sam Levinson and The Weeknd's portrayal, perspective, and objectification of women is horrible. And it's, I think, uniquely horrible, at least for now and what I've seen. But it's not uncommon at all for men, mostly, to view women and femme people this way. One of the points that I really harped on was how performative all of these sex scenes, and there were a lot in that show, were, and how the women didn't seem to be having sex. It seemed like sex was being done to them for a very clear male audience. So I decided that I wanted to continue that conversation. So that's what this video is all about, sexual performativity and the male gaze. So when it comes to the pressure to perform during sex, I think most of it stems from, or a lot of it at least stems from, this cultural hyperfixation on orgasm and an over-exaggeration of pleasure generally. Disclaimer, I am not arguing that the desire to orgasm is what's wrong. I am, however, arguing that the pressure to do so, the pressure to perform in any way during sex, is what's harmful. Brianne Foss states in Performing Sex, Hyde and Delameter argued that placing orgasm as the centerpiece of sex results in problematic consequences. Our discussions of sex tend to focus on orgasm rather than pleasure in general. Orgasm is that observable product, and we are concerned with how many orgasms we have, much as a plant manager is concerned with how many cans of soup are produced on the assembly line each day. So, sexual pleasure is oftentimes filed down to a transactional act. The reasoning behind this is ultimately boiled down to... Well, yeah. It's honestly that. Like Jocelyn, the main character of the idol that I was basing most of the analysis off of in that video, women and femme presenting people's pleasure is carefully supervised and presented as a kind of reward in a way. Within performing sex, Foz conducts a study on 40 different women, interviewing them about their experiences with and perspectives of sexuality. Quote, women who regularly experienced orgasm mentioned self-blame surrounding orgasm as an important issue for them. Notably, orgasm as a form of labor inscribed as something male partners invest into women appeared frequently. In other words, many women who engage in sex with cisgendered men view their own sexual pleasure as a validation of men's work. Unfortunately, this incentivizes faking orgasm or just pleasure in general. Interestingly, though, Foz did not find this view of orgasm or pleasure when it came to cis male counterparts. Quote, The gift paradigm almost never appeared when women discussed their male partner's orgasms, in that women did not construct themselves as givers of orgasm when having sex with men. More often, men had orgasms rather than received them. 
There's also an issue with labeling this pressure as performance anxiety in the first place. In her dissertation, Clara Mastracola states, By labeling sex a performance, it conjures up a mindset that is evaluative, self-critical, self-conscious, and tense, as if sex is something to be scrutinized by spectators. Approaching sex with apprehension often results in bringing about the very sexual problem being worried about in the first place. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy of negative self-evaluation leading to unsatisfying sexual experiences, which then fortifies continually damaging thoughts and beliefs. To summarize everything that I've said in the video so far, basically there's this pressure to orgasm because it's propped up to be the quote-unquote goal of sex and saying and acting as though there is a goal to sex at all is what makes it difficult and maybe in some cases prevents enjoyment of sex and or orgasm. It's an endless cycle like an Ouroboros constantly devouring itself. Now I want to turn your attention slightly to Khadija Mbo, their channel and the video that I'm referring to in this section will be linked along with the other sources for this video. But they recently just made, actually like super recently, like maybe a day or two ago, um, a video called Celebrities and Self-Sexualization. And go watch that video first off because that conversation all on its own is incredibly interesting. But I think that a lot of the points that Umbo was making can apply to the conversation for this video as well. They interviewed Julia Serrano, who is an author, and I will link where to find Serrano's page. And during one of the interview portions of the video, Umbo asked about Serrano's take on the concept of being marked. As a brief summary, in linguistics and social sciences, Markedness is the state of standing out as non-typical or divergent as opposed to regular or common. So for example, black girls have historically been marked as hypersexual just because of their race. Specifically, Mbo asked about the distinction between being marked as having sex and being marked by sex. Serrano answered, I think that there are two sorts of mindsets that are playing into this. And so one of the mindsets that we're socialized to learn is, I call it the predator-prey mindset. This idea that men are sexual initiators or aggressors and women are sexual objects that men pursue. And in that construct, one of the things that comes out of it is women are sex or have sex and men are trying to get that sex. So it's like a cat and mouse chase. Even outside of sexual contexts and, of course, within them, men have historically been socialized and taught to chase sexual ownership over women and or femme-presenting people. And then go one step further if they're sleeping with said women or femme people to chase the women and femme people's pleasure as a kind of certification of that ownership even better of that masculinity. But the forced idea that women are sex can also harm people who don't even engage in sex with men a lot or are not attracted to them at all. Ever heard of compulsory heterosexuality? Well, it's a term popularized by Adrienne Rich in her 1980 essay, Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence. Compulsory heterosexuality, or compets for short, is a system of oppression that denies people's sexual self-determination by presenting heterosexuality as the sole model of acceptable sexual and romantic relationships. In the same study on 40 Women by Foz, she states, In lesbian relationships, the gift metaphor was sometimes mutual, where each partner gave and neither partner had an orgasm. This implies that the gift metaphor applies to lesbian sexual relationships. Even women who chose not to have sex with men still retained ideas about women's lack of sexual agency. 
In other words, it appears that gender socialization from an early age oriented toward receiving orgasm sticks with women regardless of their sexual identity as an adult. You may be saying, the hypothetical you, may be saying, oh, well, queer identities don't have to be hidden anymore. It's not illegal anymore. So they're not affected by these paradigms and expectations anyway. Well, the fact that, let's be honest, on the surface, people can marry or be with whoever they want or identify as whatever they would like to is kind of irrelevant to this conversation. To put it into perspective, it's like when people claim, well, we've had a civil rights movement already, so racism doesn't exist or harm people. And those systems, even prior to civil rights, don't harm people anymore. Which we know is not true. These structures have long-lasting effects. That's kind of the whole point. Again, it's the system that's the problem. It's patriarchy that's the problem. It's viewing people as products and everything we do is transactional. That's the problem. I also want to briefly acknowledge that compulsory heterosexuality has oftentimes been weaponized against bisexual people and pansexual people, I being one of them. I've heard it all, I think. So I'll give a quick example of compet arguments being used to delegitimize pansexuality and bisexuality. In a sex-obsessed world, it appeared that no one wanted to know about bisexual sex. Why? Well, because it's not a real sexual orientation, somehow. Did I mention that bi is code for gay? And you know, it's just a trendy way for straight girls to fit in with other radical and oppressed folks. <clears throat> that right there is a whole other video. And to be clear, Baumgartner is pointing out biphobia, not engaging in it, if you're not familiar with her work. But anyways, I still think this idea of compet has legs because it's true that queer women, femme people, afab people, and literally everyone else are ex still expected to exist within heteronormative, cisnormative standards in practically every way. You know, it's like, be whoever you want, exist however you want to, as long as it's tolerable for the male gaze. So this, of course, includes expectations for sex. Calling back to the quote that I used at the beginning of the video, how can we truly be free if freedom is on the terms of the people who were oppressing us in the first place? How can women and femme people truly enjoy their sexual liberation if it's the patriarchy's version of it? Well, a good place to start is if we can deconstruct the current definitions of satisfaction and instead label orgasm as one of the many possibilities of sex and pleasure instead of as a requirement for enjoyment and legitimacy, it can overall lessen the urgency that comes along with that pressure and make sex, whatever it looks like to different individual people, about how it feels. That's what it's all about dismantling and creating something new for the betterment of people's lives. So where have you noticed the pressure to perform, even outside of sexual contexts? How do you think that we can dismantle this pressure? I will leave you with that. See you next time.